The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. We're in chapters 8, 9, and 10. It is a passage that specifically deals with the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. <clears throat> and let me say to you that probably if, if you were <clears throat> reading <clears throat> chapters 8, 9, and 10, <clears throat> if, you were, if you're just casual, I don't, being a part of this class, and I said go home and, like I normally tell you, and read this passage several times. <clears throat> Probably the one part of this whole chapter 8, 9, and 10 that you would skip over <clears throat> would be my subject matter tonight. <clears throat> and when we read it, you'll probably see why you would probably do that. And hopefully, when I get through tonight, you would realize that that would be a big mistake. <clears throat> and the reason for it is it deals with so many technical things out of the old covenant, sacrifices. And we kind of, and I understand that, we un we're under a new covenant, we're not under that covenant, so we kind of blow right through it, except we forget something. The old covenant was shadow Christology to the new, and Jesus said, I've come to fulfill it not to abolish it. So understanding that, how his new covenant, how the new covenant fulfilled the old covenant and how it changed for our benefit and how we are so much better off having done that is why this passage is kind of important and why the writer put it in. So here we are in verse 16. And he says, for where a covenant is, which means he's taken up the subject for where. I'm going to talk about that a little later, but for where is really important in the Greek language. That's really important because he's going back to expand now. See, verses 14 and 15 is the new covenant, and Christ is the mediator of it. And Without him, the old covenant is still in, yada, yada. So he says, for when a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. Now, that's not really a good translation, so I'm going to clean all that up in a moment. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. And he's talking about the ones who have entered the covenant, the covenant maker. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Okay? Now, we would understand that inheritance and wills and things like that. But this goes way beyond that. That This is not what that's really talking about. Verse 18, therefore, based on 16 and 17, by the, by the way, is one Greek sentence. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated or installed without blood. See? Now, whatever he said in verse 17 and eight, 16 and 17, verse 18 has made a conclusion. Therefore, right? That's a conclusion word. Therefore, the first covenant was not inaugurated or installed without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he would take the blood of the calves and the goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssops and sprinkle with the, both the book itself and all the people and in doing that, he would, he would say to them, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Now, what he doesn't say, which we'll look at, is what the people say. The people, when he says that, then the people have a response. We'll talk about that. And in the same way, he sprinkles both the tabernacle and all the sacrificial vessels of the ministry with blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, 
all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In other words, there are some exceptions. Well, let me, there are some, almost all. There are some exceptions, and here would be one that you would be probably familiar with. Here would be one exception. If you were too poor and could not afford a lamb, you could get uh, what we would call a pigeon, a turtle dove, or a dove, right? You could get that, and you could offer that, and that would be acceptable. That would be almost everything would be an example of that, and that that's a classic example of what he means. You with me? Okay, that's now. Just because of all the sprinkling and the, the blood and the people and the yada yada, we kind of just float through all that, and yet all of that was important because every bit of that was shadow Christology in the most important place of Christ's life, and that is the cross. And all of that's going to have to be fulfilled with him on the cross. Now, what we get from all of that is the forgiveness of sins. This whole thing boils down to you and I. We receive the forgiveness of sins, which is unconditionally because of the condition placed on him on the cross. But all of that stuff has gone on for thousands of years, and it has to be by the letter of the law in order for Christ to fulfill the letter of the law. And when he dies on the cross, he does. And all of this points towards whoever dies on that cross that can fulfill that old covenant is the messianic savior of the world. That's a pretty big deal, wouldn't you say? We send missionaries around the world for that. <coughs> By the way, Rick, Rick, where are you headed out in June again? Malawi. Say it again. Malawi. 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 Well, you'll know. We'll struggle with that for a while. Seems like everywhere he goes, I can't seem to get that thing. Uh, good thing I'm from Alabama. <laughs> Alabama, I can get that. All right, well, let's, let's open with a word of prayer. And we'll take a look at this and see the dynamics of what the, why the writer I includes this kind of information. <coughs> Primarily because the two key words in this passage is the word death and blood. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because it's, this is a spiritual book, the Bible, for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The Holy Spirit is here to teach you the truth about it to, so that you can exercise that truth into your life and have a ministry at other people who need to know the importance of that. Uh, carnality hinders that. Evidence of carnality in our life would be personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins that are unconfessed in order to come back into a spiritual fellowship relationship with the Lord. Confession of sin will do it. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. In fact, this blood discussion we're having today is all about the cleansing and it brings you back into, as a Christian, back into fellowship with the Lord of First John 1, 5. So, Father, we're thankful tonight for these have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. And we pray that people on the Internet would say, show the same courtesy of classroom etiquette as these do here in the assembly hour. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of our study tonight Why we're not under the old law. Why we're not under the law. And who is the mediator of the new one? Who is the mediator between the old covenant and the new covenant to bring people through the mediator into God? That person, according to verse 15, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And how did he do that? He died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and everybody who believes it receives it. Everybody who relieves, believes it receives it. I pray this upon those of us that are in the study tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, 
the key to reading chapters 8, 9, and 10 is to understand that what we're dis discussing, what the writer is writing about, is the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. And the, these three chapters are just dynamic. In fact, they're the classic passages for this discussion in theology. That's the reason we're going into it in pretty good length. What the writer is saying is that the covenant, now listen to me, the biblical covenant that is known for the blood of Christ is the covenant of, return, of eternal redemption in verse 12, ninth chapter, verse 12. It is the covenant of an eternal inheritance in verse 15. And in the third, 13 chapter, verse 20, it is the eternal covenant. What is the qualifications for that? What is the qualification for that? It requires the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. What the writer is trying to show is that Jesus qualified. He qualified in that, that he qualified as the mediator. When you and I enter into salvation, we enter into a, an eternal redemption, an, internal inher an eternal inheritance, and an eternal covenant with God and all of that is based on this fact and so the point uh, the point the writers making in chapter 9 is that very fact now when we looked at this passage you probably been, didn't pay that much attention to it just walking through reading but the two key words the dominant words in this passage is death and blood right I mean death and blood and they're synonymous and if there's no death there's no blood so he talks about the death first and the blood second. It is the death blood that makes the person that, that does that. Now, we already know who that is because we know chapter, uh, we know the verses 14 and 15. So let's go back for a moment because the word for where, look at, look at verse 16. For where a covenant, for where, uh, points us back there. And so he, he uses this phrase, how much more? That's a superior word. How much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. It was for this reason. He is the mediator of the new covenant. The mediator. That's 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. Or John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant in order that, in order that since a death has taken place for redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, Adam's original sin, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now he enters this subject <clears throat> with the words for where. For where? And we'll come back to that in a moment. For where? In the, ninth, in the 10th chapter where we're headed, <clears throat> probably by the time summer's over, but I don't know, but chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says this, and he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, now listen to me. What, what, you know what that is? It is a whole phrase. By this will, look at, look, look, it's a whole phrase. I have come to do your will. Are you with me? Look, you know this famous line of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's talking about the cup with going to the cross and all that? Not my but thy will be done. This is the deal. And that little phrase, I have come to do your will. By doing that, he's going, to, he's going to take away the first in order to establish the second covenant, take away the old covenant to establish the new covenant. By this will, the surrender of his life to the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection as the second member of the Godhead. By this will, we... Notice the we. It's the I to the we. See the phrase, I have come? 
by this will we, come on now, we, by this will we, that's church age believers, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right? And what he's talking about, Peter talks about in 1 Peter 2.24 about his body bearing this, our sins. His body to qualify for that has to be virgin birth and impeccable at death. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, the 2 Corinthians 5.21. Ryrie, in his uh, study Bible of the New American Standard, Ryrie's footnotes on 9.16, here's what he said. And it's a great statement. This is the strong proof that it is the death of Christ, not his life. You know, people will say, well, I'm familiar with the life of Christ. I believe he was a, I, li I think he was a great prophet. I think he, 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 he was a great moral person. I think he was this. I think he was that. Nobody gets saved by that. Not a person in the world will ever be saved by that kind of information. What he has to believe that he qualified to go to the cross to die for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead. Anybody can get saved with that one. We don't follow a guy with a moral law. We follow a guy who went to the cross and died for my sins that I might be saved forever. It's the guy I follow. Not a lot of moral people. This is strong. This is strong proof that the death of Christ, not his life, that puts into effect the new covenant with all of its blessings. His sinless life qualified him to become a suitable sacrifice for sin, but it was his death that made the payment for sin. He's right on the money on that. And, and his point is this is what the writer is trying to point out. Now, we're going to study five aspects of the covenant, uh, the covenant of the blood of Christ because that's the point. And I want, to, I want you to look the next time you look over these scriptures, I want you to look at my outline of, uh, of the points. Verses 16 and seven, 17, a covenant is validated by a specific death of a person or a death of a specific person, but it has to be a specific death of a person that qualifies. And shadow Christology shows you how tough that qualification would be. Holy catfish, you study all the laws connected with the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ that was required is amazing. Oh, man. In verse 18, the covenant has to be inaugurated or installed. It requires specific blood. It did under the old covenant. You couldn't just offer any blood. And, it, and, and even if you had the animal, it couldn't be just any animal, I want a calf and a goat, but it has to be kosher, you know. It, ha it can have no birth defects. It can have no growth defects. It's got to be perfect in its category or it does not offer. You can't just offer it because you got a calf and say, well, I, you know, I can't sell it. It's, it's got a disease, can't eat it, so I'll offer it to the Lord. That's how you get in big trouble because that represented the Christ, his son dying on a cross. And everybody who tried that foolishness got burnt for it. Got big time burnt. In verses 19 through 21, he talks about the sprinkling of the blood. It requires a specific uh, uh, religious or sacrificial ceremony of shadow Christology. There was, it was specific. And then verse 20, and we're going to study this. In verse 22, we're going to study the covenant shedding, not the sprinkling, but the shedding. These are terms that are very important to the old covenant that are important to the new covenant as Christ has to fulfill it. Requires a specific cleansing for the forgiveness of sin. This, I'm just trying to tell you this passage is dynamic. And I'm not going to make you have to study the whole stuff. I'm going to give you the cliff note version of it. But it's very important. Now, 
in the ninth in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, verse sixteen and seventeen, it's one sentence in the Greek, and that's important because that's one completed thought. It's 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 written in two verses, but it's one Greek sentence, and that's important because listen to let me tell you why it's important. Look at verse sixteen for a minute. See the word for. That's an explanatory gar. See that? Look at verse 17. See the word for? Well, that's a connector gar. That's an explanatory gar. Those are, these are two. In other words, he's explaining something, and he's trying to, is, and he contains one idea, one thought, one thought. <clears throat> one Greek sentence explains that this one Greek sentence explains that the divine covenant involving the forgiveness of sins requires a death. Notice that in verse 16 and 17, he uses this word death twice. The word death or de de dead twice. This is based on, on the covenant conditions. In other words, it requires a death, it requires blood, but it has to be specific, right? Can't just be, can't be just any animal. It can't be just any old blood. Okay. In Hebrews 9.16, it opens with an important prepositional phrase. People don't pay any attention to prepositional phrase unless you're a Greek student. If you're a Greek student, then you really pay attention to Greek, uh, to uh, prepositional phrases. All kinds of idioms and great theology come out of prepositional phrases in the New Testament. So I, I bring that to your attention because I'm a, one of the guys who pay a lot of attention to it. And here's the preposition for where a covenant in verse 16, for where a covenant is, there, and then he goes on to discuss it. For where a covenant is, right? Look, for where there, for where, for where a covenant is, what? Comma. Right? We all know that's a prepositional phrase. Comma. Now, it opens with this prepositional phrase. The word for is gar. It's an explanatory particle explaining what he's been explaining. He's, he's continually explaining chapter 9, which is the superiority of, <laughs> of the covenant, of the new covenant over the old covenant. So he uses this, and, and he uses, and the word where is important. The word where is a relative adverb of conditions. And so he's going to explain it. He says, and he set it all up. He says, for where a covenant is. Now, he's explained the covenant in verse 14, 15. He's already explained it. So this is a gar in a series of gars, you know, like cigars. It's a series. You got a whole box here for where a covenant is. Now, he's been talking about the covenant has been the subject, especially of verse 15. For, the, for this reason, he is the meteor of the new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance of the new covenant. Right? So when he says for, for where a covenant is, there has to be the right death and the right blood. Watch how he says it. After the comma, he says, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. You with me? Now, you, you need to understand and I'm about to do, go there in just a moment with that. Notice where I say in verse 14, a mediator. We're talking about the mediator, verse 14 and 15. The word for is a connector. I call it trailer hitch. <laughs> okay? The word death is thanatos. It has a spiritual connotation. It's not death like, like I went to a funeral the other day. This is a death. This is a death that doesn't require, this is not about a funeral, okay? It has to do with God's opinion about this thing. There's an opinion that God has about this kind of death, not a funeral. To explain the death of the one who made it. But I want, now watch this. Now, this is technical because that's not what it says. That's not, that's not literal enough. This makes it sound like the one who made the covenant is the one who's got to die. Well, you know who made the covenant? God. You got to die. 
that's not what this is talking about. Notice the T-O-U, that's a definite article. And that's because there's a participle. It's the one who, the one who. That's a definite article with a participle. We call it an articulate participle. Okay? If you want to know how I make my big money. All right? Then it's got a compound word, dia. Say dia. Tithemi. Now, it's an aorist middle participle, but what this refers to as the anointed one. This is the anointed one. This should read, the anointed one. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the anointed one, the appointed one. The appoint I said anointed, but I mean appointed one. The appointed one. Now, who is the appointed one? Verse 15 has already told us. The appointed one is the mediator. The one who dies to bring a holy God and sinful man together in a proper way. Right? See, the appointed one has already been described, already identified as the mediator. That's what this, this is what this Greek word refers to. Later, this comes out, like in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, right? And then it goes on to say, because he paid, the, he paid, the, he paid off the payment. He paid the payment. He, he ransomed us. John 14, 6 says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That's the appointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah, the anointed one that God has now appointed to go to the cross and die there. And that's the will part. I, I must do the will of God. I must do the will of my father. So it's very important you clean that mess up. Right? Because it's misleading the way it is. In my opinion, I cleaned it up. In John 6, 38, Jesus told his disciples, I have come down from heaven. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's a big deal. Now, what do you think God expects from you and I as sons of God? Expects us to do his will, doesn't he? Expects us to be obedient. This is the famous saying of Jesus in Matthew 26, 39, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? I mean, but he knew this. I mean, clear as a bell from the age of 12. From the age of 12, he had a clear, I don't know before then, but we're told at 12, he had a clear vision of this whole thing, a very clear. You know how important it is to have a clear understanding of why you're here on earth? It's very important you know that. I mean, you're just not, you weren't just hatched for no reason. In, in uh, Hebrews 9, 17, it begins with a second explanatory garb to explain further, and this time, how to know if the covenant is valid. How do you know if the covenant is valid? For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never, for man, in this case, a man, for it is never enforced while the one who made it or uh, the one who's been appointed lives. See, it's the same word, the same word in verse 17 that was in verse 16 about the one who made it is the one appointed, the one appointed. It's the one appointed. Is the best way to understand that. This word valid means to be steadfast, firm in the will of God. It establishes the necessity of the death of the appointed one, which in verse 15 told us it is the mediator. Who is that? The one whose death qualifies his blood to forgive us of all of our sins. 
And, and, and listen, if he, doesn't, if he lives and doesn't die, he's not the man. He's got to go to the cross to die. He can't die some natural death either. Old age or whatever, car got him, whatever. That ain't going to work. Point number three. When the first covenant was installed, validated, when the first covenant, when the first covenant was installed, it was done by the blood of animals. See, that's verse 18. Therefore, even, this word, therefore, even, is really an interesting word. It's hothen. It's an inferential conjunction. Now, listen to me why it's used. It is used. I, I did, did I say sing, signals a big shift? Yeah. It, what it does it, in the Greek language, it shifts. It, it's a signal that there's going to be a shift in the subject. They're related, but a shift in the subject. And the, listen to me. And the, this word says we're shifting now from the importance of the death to the importance of the blood from the death. The, the, you know, there always was a death of an animal, kosher, in order for the blood to be taken so that it could be uh, a, 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 a appropriated to, properly. Are you with me? By law. That's that word. He said, now look. There's going to become, and this is a way you signal, there's going to be a shift in the subject that's still related. I'm talking about the right death to get the right blood. There has to be the right death to have the right blood. That makes it really important. Therefore, even the first covenant, the word he there on your paper's definite article, even the first covenant, was not inaugurated or installed. Not is a very strong not. Without blood. Without blood. When the old covenant was installed by Moses, if you go back and study Exodus and, you know, the, the four that Moses is given credit for. When the old covenant was installed by Moses, listen to me, it was new. It wasn't called the new covenant, but it was a new installment of a covenant. It was a new installment of a covenant. Well, we've had covenants before. We had an Abrahamic covenant. We had an Adamic covenant, right? We've had covenants before. He installed a new one, this time requiring uh, blood uh, under a law concept. It remained this first covenant. Now, listen to me. This first covenant is going to remain until Christ brings in a new covenant and he will install the new covenant. Moses, the first covenant, Jesus Christ, the second covenant. And if you, he's already discussed that earlier in his book, how Jesus trumps, uh, overrules Moses, right? That's chapters like two and three, four. So I mean, he's just going back to a subject he's already covered. For if the first covenant Remember this one in the 8th chapter, verse 7 and 13? He said, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. Remember that? And, of course, we just studied that in the chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. In Hebrews 8, 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by talking about Christ, but as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. You see, here, here's the point for us tonight. We sat under a new covenant of grace. We didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, didn't earn it to get into it. Don't earn to stay in it. But we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God, not of works, least any man boast. The only boast can go is to God and the work of Christ on the cross, his very own resurrection. Now, what the writer is saying that you and I are under, listen, we have a better ministry than anybody in the Old Testament. Think about that. There are some giants in the Old Testament as far as ministry. We have a better ministry. We have, listen, we have a better covenant. 
uh, th all this right out of your paper and a better pro with better promises. We have a better ministry, a better covenant, and better promises. Why do, we, why do we sit around and moan and groan and complain all the time? I mean, sometimes I think we, we think we would be happier if we were back in Egypt under, uh, you know, under, listen, what are we talking about? So the writer said, and that's what he's talking about in the ninth chapter, verse 15, when he talks about the mediator of Jesus Christ. Point four, shadow Christology, this is what we're talking about, shadow Christology of the first covenant sprinkled the blood year after year after year, pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ when they wouldn't have to do it anymore, that he would fulfill it, right? He would fulfill that whole, whole concept. Now, when you read verses 19 through 21, I want to go back to Hebrews 9. Where he gets into this, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, the water and the scarlet wool of hyssops, and sprinkled both the book, that, that's, that's the book of Deuteronomy that was with the covenant, sprinkled the book itself and all the people, and he would say, this is the blood of the commandment which God commanded you. Now, when you go to Exodus, not tonight, but when you go to Exodus 20, it's on your paper, but when you go to Exodus 24, 3 through 8, you will see this whole thing laid out for you. And when, when he would do that with the people, the people would say, that they would, it was a, a response, they would say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. That's in 24, 7. Okay? Now, he goes on and he says, all of this is found in, in that passage. Then he goes on and says, and in the same way, he sprinkles both the tabernacle and the, the sacrificial vessels of the ministry with the blood, right? See, all of that, and I put it on your paper, I hope. I, I hope I put Exodus 24, 3 through 9. Because you can go back and you can read all this for yourself, all right? I mean, it's, you're not going to have to have anybody hold your hand. You can read it. And, and so... So here's what he's that here, here's what was sprinkled. Now there's more to this, but, it, but roughly he says he, he sprinkles the book of the law, right? Deuteronomy, the book of the law that was kept in the Ark of the Covenant, of the people, the tabernacle, and the vessels. Right? All of that's connected with the blood that, under the old covenant. He, he sprinkled. He sprinkled. And, the, and they have to do it year after year after year after year after year, right? Why? Until Christ comes. They can fulfill it. Did they know that? Of course they knew it. it listen, everybody knows the word of God until they go apostate, right? You go apostate, then, you know, it's out the door, but. Who does, not need who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices? This is, this is Hebrews 7.29. Who, who does not need daily like those high priests who, he's talking about Jesus Christ, uh, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this Christ did once for all when he offered up himself. See, he's already discussed this. It's not like we don't know this. That's in chapter 7, verse 27. Now, where did it begin? Where did this sprinkling business begin? In the Exodus. The Passover of the Exodus is where this whole thing started and continued. In Exodus 12, 22. Now, I put, I put the passage that you should read and, and more if you're interested. He says, you shall take a bunch of hyssops and dip them in blood which is in the basin, and apply some to the lentil. That's the part that goes over the two doorposts and the down the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of this house until morning. Why? Angel. Death angels passing over. You go outside. 
cook goose. And we're only taking calves and goats. I want to show you something. We're in Hebrews. Still in Hebrews? Go to the 11th chapter with me. Show you something interesting. Now this I have meaning to you because of this little study we've got. Verse 28. By faith. Talk about Moses. By faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. You know what that, you know what he did? Sprinkling. Sprinkling of the blood. The sprinkling involved blood and water, as our passage t taught us. And by the way, that's where some people get the idea of sprinkling of water with conversions. That's their proof text for many of them that study the Bible. <laughs> which is, I'm just telling you where they get it. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says that Christ is our Passover lamb because he is our sacrifice. He's the sacrifice for sin. Christ, our Passover. If John, John 1, 29, behold, the lamb of God that's come to take, the lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You know what the blood of Abel was? Innocent blood. The in it, listen, the death of innocent blood that was righteous blood. That means under the blood of Christ. Understand, uh, old covenant. I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, this is also brought in in 1 Peter 1, 2. I don't know. Will I show that to you? Yeah, I'll show it to you later. Five. Well, I'm busting along tonight. I can't believe, you know. You have no idea how long it took me to study all this stuff to get through this quick. It just irritates me. Jeez, I'm going to drag my feet a little bit. <laughs> yeah. For all time. Okay. Covers those in the past, present, and future of those who, of those who believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, he died for everybody, didn't he? But only those who believe get it, receive it. You got it. You, if you believe, you receive. That's it. Yeah, you got that right. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. I'm glad he didn't come to a vote. I wouldn't have got in. I wouldn't have got in. I just promise you, it would have been to a local vote anyhow. Maybe if I, people didn't know me, I'd have got in. The Greek word used for shedding of the blood is interesting. Look at this word I laid out there for you. Now, see the word, see the T in that word? This is the only time this word is ever used in the New Testament combined. See the word T? Well, that T is put there to divide two complete words. So the first word, H-A-I-M-A, -A, Haima, that's the word blood. Haima. And see the word T? That's there to separate these two words. And ek shusia, that's the word for uh, shedding, shedding the blood. That one word together means shedding. It means to, this word means to pour out or to shed. Shedding of the blood. That's one word, shedding of the blood. It's the only time it's used in the, in the New Testament in Hebrews 9.22. 922 is the only time this Greek form of the word is used. In 922, it says, and according to the law, one may almost say, and I explained that, right? May almost say, 
talking about maybe some exceptions. All things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, and there's our word, there is no forgiveness. Now, these two words, these two Greek words for the shedding of blood, are used separately in the New Testament. This is the only time they're used combined. Are you with me? Into one word. For example, in Matthew 23, 35, Let's go there and look at a couple of these since I've got a little bit of time. Matthew 23, 35, 23, where we have these two words, not put together, but separate, but having the same meaning. 20, 23, 35, 23, 35. Here's that, it mentions the blood of Abel again. That upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood. Now, your, some translations might even say innocent, but it's innocent in the sense that there was no cause, that they were killed because they were, it, they were righteous, martyred, shed on earth. The blood fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. And then he goes on to discuss that, Okay. There's an example of this. Here's another one in Acts. Drop over to Acts with me, 22. And this is, Paul, Paul uses this in a testimony. He's given his salvation testimony in Acts 22. Uh, it's one of three places he actually lays out his whole testimony of salvation. 22, 20. And, and Paul in his testimony talks about Stephen. And he says in verse 20, and when the blood of thy witness, Stephen, was being shed. That means that's a reference to righteous blood. See, Paul's got a completely change of heart about everything now, hadn't he? Conversion. Uh, the blood of the witness, Stephen, was being shed. I was standing by approving and watching uh, out for the cloaks of those who were slaying him. See that? Yeah, killing him. All right, killing him. Now, this word again is used in a very famous passage to us that we, we pay attention to on Eucharist days. This is Luke 22. Of course, we read it out of 1 Corinthians uh, 11. But here it is, uh, and it's there too, but here we read it. Uh, 2220 at the Last Supper, 2022. And it is our word shedding blood. Uh, 2022. No. 2220. 2220. 2220. Yeah, here it is. In the same way, he took the cup after supper after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out is the word shed in the Greek. That's our same word in the Greek, shed. For you is the new covenant in my blood. Same word for blood. See there? That's what this whole thing is about. All of that stuff in the Old Testament. Now, it's all important because it points He's got to do everything to fulfill everything out of that old covenant. He's got to do it on the cross, connected with death and blood. In the same way, this is, oh, I just read that. Now, let me close with 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. Listen to what it says. Talked about the ministry to the Jew. Their, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed only in Christ. Isn't that something? They read the Old Testament and they're looking for Christ to come. The veil is there. What do you mean Christ is coming? When he comes, it's going to be a bad day for you. What are you talking about? Christ has already come to open the door for you to come in by grace. 
Listen to the second, verse 15. See the word but? Three times. These are links. That's the first but. Here's the second one. But to this day, see he's in that same discussion about how hard, it, how, how the, the veil over their hearts. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, that's the law, a veil lies over their heart. It can only be removed by what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, listen, you should never step backward from talking to a Jew about Jesus Christ. Right? It's going to be a tough one. Listen, I've talked to a lot of them. They're usually very open to listen to you. They're very difficult for it to get to believe. But I've never had one that didn't let me talk. I get right to the point and tell them what's all about. I mean, who better than you should know what I'm talking about? Yeshua? What are we talking about? We're talking about your Messiah. Let me tell you something. That's who I follow. Come on, you don't follow him. <laughs> Here's the third but. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. How do you turn to the Lord? You have to believe to receive. You got to believe. You got to believe that he came and fulfilled this issue. He is the Messiah. He came to die on that cross to fulfill that covenant, to bring it, not to abolish, but to bring it into fulfillment. That's what he said. And you know what he said? Then the veil is removed. Won't be removed without it. But then the veil's removed. They say, I got converted. I got converted under a Jew. I got converted under a Jew. Well, you talk about somebody blow fire out of his nostrils. That guy would blow fire. You talk about a guy who's dogmatic. Dogmatic. Converted Jew. Well, anyhow, hope that was helpful. All right, Don, let's take it. Oh, I, I got to do prayer, yeah. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and Internet. I pray tonight, Father, we would understand that whether the veil is there or the veil isn't there, what is important, a person come to realize his sinfulness is through Adam's sin. Not through his personal sin. It's through Adam's sin that we're under judgment. We're, we're under the judgment. And I pray, Father, we would understand that he is the only mediator between sinful man and a righteous God. Is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, being buried and raised from the dead the third day, and everybody who believes it receives it. I pray for that tonight. I pray for those who are listening around the world to us tonight. Would stop and understand. This is received by faith and not by sight. It's received by faith, not by logic, not by rationale. Not by empiricistic ideas of what I have to do to receive. I say to you tonight what you have to do to receive. Salvation is to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You say to me, Ron, that's too easy. It's supposed to be. Christ did all the work. It wasn't easy for him. Six hours on the cross of crucifixion for the, bearing the sins of the world. Listen, that's way beyond crucifixion. Crucifixion in itself was terrible. But what he bore the last three hours was beyond the crucifixion that we might not be punished for sin. So I pray tonight, Father, we may receive it by faith through grace and not of themselves as a gift from God in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. 
He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for